Thank you very much, John. Um, good evening to everybody. Thank you for being here uh, for the presentation. And I really want to thank John Kovach for extending the invitation for me to be here. Um, I'm looking forward uh, to sharing this work and getting your feedback uh, and questions on it. And it's really a pleasure to be uh, in the inaugural a year of the lect of le lecture series here at the Institute for Popular Music, and I also wanted to uh, thank the Frederick Douglass Institute for African and African American Studies for co-sponsoring the event. And finally, I want to thank Elaine Stroh uh, for managing the details of the visit, um, because I wouldn't be here if she hadn't put it all together. Uh, so tonight I'm going to present, oh, and I should ask, are you hearing me okay? We spent a lot of time trying to make sure the sound was good. Okay. Uh, if you suddenly stop hearing me, throw up a flag so I can make an adjustment. Uh, tonight I'm going to present some of the research I've been doing on African American women in rock and roll. In this paper, I focus on the late 1960s and early 1970s, a period when African American women such as Mary Clayton, P.P. P. Arnold, Madeline Bell, Ava Cherry, Carolyn Dennis, Vanetta Fields, Gloria Jones, Clyde King, Claudia Lanier, and Doris Troy brought their gospel-trained voices to rock and roll, shaping the sound of what is now dubbed classic rock. They recorded and performed in, co in concert with artists such as The Small Faces, The Rolling Stones, Joe Cocker, Pink Floyd, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, Humble Pie, John Lennon, George Harrison, Leonard Skinner, Steely Dan, T-Rex, and Neil Young. I'm interested in putting these black background singers and the practice of using background singers and rock recordings into the foreground to challenge conventional wisdom at a few different levels. First, I want to discuss the role black women played in creating the authentic sound sought by white rock artists with whom they collaborated. This allows me to draw attention to the undeniable but usually overlooked sonic presence of African American women in rock. Here, my goal is to expand the ways we think about the sound of rock music. Talking about background vocalists also allows me to mark the participation of black women in a field of cultural production to which they are not typically linked. Here, my goal is to expand the ways we think about African American women as cultural producers. An additional goal is to give some consideration to the simultaneous vocal presence of black women in rock and their absence in critical and historical representations of rock. Uh, and as John mentioned, by training, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I feel like I should say something about the reason I'm giving a paper on popular music history and not a more explicitly ethnographic project. Um, in many cases, our research collaborators or subjects or informants uh, guide us in our research. Um, and in the purple haze following the completion of my book on the Black Rock Coalition, which John mentioned, um, I was looking for a new project. And I began talking with African American women musicians who were producing rock or alternative music or otherwise unconventional for black people music. In other words, not R&B and not rap. And in addition to talking to them about their music, their strategies for circulating it, and the challenges they believe they face as black women making this kind of music, we kept having conversations about the black women who had come before them uh, in the rock and roll field and about the absence of information about these women. So I found myself thinking about the dominant rock and roll narrative, a romantic tale of male geniuses and bad boy iconoclasts, and how different that narrative was when black women's presence and voices were added to the mix. In this project, I'm trying to br bring a perspective informed by the fields of cultural anthropology and ethnomusicology to bear on historical materials. Um, so at one level, I'm doing the sort of classical, classic anthropological move of trying to make the familiar strange by revisiting the history of rock from a different point of view. And at another level, I'm trying to incorporate the voices of artists who have been marginalized from mainstream memory, a version of the kind of giving voice that so much ethnomusicology and anthropology try to do. Uh, and finally, I'm in investigating issues of power and the construction of meaning, central concerns in both fields. And then on a more personal level, this research was an opportunity for me, a longtime fan of rock, to learn and tell stories that I wish I had known many years ago when I first started exploring the music as a preteen. In other words, I am writing a book I wish I had been able to read. So the material that I'm presenting in this project is um, part of this book, and I want to frame my paper tonight with some of the larger questions I'm dealing with. Chiefly, the relationship between music, identity, authenticity, and power. Uh, rock and roll is a medium through which individuals construct and circulate ideas about gender, race, class, and sexuality. 
These ideas shape the practices and beliefs of rock musicians, producers, and fans, and they also influence the ways and whether people are able to participate in the form, and the ways and whether that participation is recognized. So tonight I'm going to uh, approach these issues through the example of black women background vocalists. I'm going to play some brief musical examples and show some images in order to attach unfamiliar names and faces to voices that are a presence in some familiar rock songs and to talk to you about why that presence was desired. So I, I have a number of images and uh, musical examples and I should say, especially since you're streaming, streaming this, that everything is used without permission. So. I hope that's okay. I'm, I'm in severe violation of, of copyright tonight. Um, so I want to start with some background on background vocalists. By the early 1970s, racially marked marketing categories separated white rock from black music. But if we listen beyond the socially constructed and economically driven sales categories to the music that the artists were actually making, we can hear the mixing of black and white musical sounds during a period usually associated with the whitening of rock. During the 1960s, white rock musicians, who were already enamored of African-American music, began experimenting with the sound and feel of gospel-inspired soul music popularized by James Brown, Aretha Franklin, and Otis Redding. Often this meant working with African-American women singers who, with gospel-trained chops, could bring soul to a song at the drop of a melismatic yeah or ooh. The result was that in recording studios and on record, there was a significant level of musical and racial integration as a critical mass of black women background singers collaborated with white rock artists. The black, backup sing the black women backup singers of the 1960s and early 1970s brought a formid formidable set of musical skills to the recording sessions and concert stages that they graced. After their race, gender, and generation, the single most notable commonality these women shared was a background that included learning to sing in church. Almost without exception, the women who provided supporting vocals on rock recordings had been raised in working class black families in which church attendance was an important practice. In these black Protestant churches, music was a critical part of worship. Beyond singing as members of, a cat of the congregation, many of these women participated in church youth choirs when they were growing up. Through early exposure to church-based music training, they developed knowledge of the mechanics of solo and ensemble singing, singing in harmony, and arranging vocals. In church choir, they learned a large repertoire of songs and internalized a performance style and discipline that they carried into the rock and roll arena. In her autobiography, noted lead and background vocalist Darlene Love quips, quote, Baptists and Pentecostal choirs were something of a farm system for the pop music big leagues. Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight, Mary Clayton all cut their teeth in the, in the choir loft." End quote. The gospel vocal sound has come to be understood and naturalized as black vocal sound, something all black people are thought to have access to and are expected to deliver. I want to briefly catalog some of the features of this sound, traditionally learned in the choir loft, as Darlene Love might put it, uh, because we'll be hearing them in the musical examples uh, that I'm about to play. And I'm drawing my list from Horace Boyer's work on gospel. Uh, so these include a full-throated full vocal timbre, often a hoarse or gravelly voice, use of vibrato, a display of vocal agility indexed through a range in which it is all right to break register and shift from a head voice to a chest voice when moving across octaves. Um, departure from the standard text, lyrically and musically, is expected. For example, the practice of interposing additional material in between parts of the written text is valued. So this can mean adding a note or several notes, ascending or descending, at the end of a musical line. It can mean the slurs, slides, and scoops of melisma. And it can mean adding material that is not part of the original lyrics, uh, extra words or phrases such as, yes, Lord, don't you know, and Lord, have mercy now. So for example, the phrase written as, Lord, I'm tired, might be sung as, Lord, you know, I'm so tired. These forms of ornamentation allow the singer to express her spiritual devotion and place a personal stamp on the song. As professional background vocalists, black women transported these vocal tropes from the sacred realm, realm of gospel to the worldly context of rock and roll, where they were embraced for their sonic freshness and difference. <laughs> 
their connection to religious and spiritual expression was mostly left behind. And significantly, these women were breaking church community expectations about using their voices only to praise God. And they had to negotiate the fact that they were singing in the world, as church folk would put it. And that was something that was really looked down upon and questioned. In recording studios in Los Angeles and London, white men and black women collaborated under a particular set of racially integrated but socially stratified working conditions. The African American women were hired guns brought in for the session. They were paid union scale for their vocal contributions, which often included developing their own arrangements. They were usually, but not always mentioned in liner notes, sometimes listed by first names only or with misspelled names. Never part of the band, they were, an, they were an integral part of the sound. The rock artists and their producers made a conscious decision to include them. Several of these women developed long-term careers doing this work. So I now want to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. In the early 1960s, the extraordinary Darlene Love and her group The Blossoms became a sought-after group for sessions led by both black and white artists. The Blossoms, an African-American trio, had the gift of vocal flexibility. As Love explains in her autobiography, and it's Love, Love, Darlene Love is in the center of this picture, uh, she says, quote, the Blossoms didn't sound white, but we didn't sound black either. The magic of the Blossoms was that we could sound whatever way we wanted, end quote. The Blossoms could sound race neutral or white when recording with white artists. Uh, they appeared on Santa Claus, Santa, Santa's Come In in a Whirly Bird by Gene Autry, Monster Mash by Bobby Boar's Pickett and the Crip Killers, Move Over Darling by Doris Day, and In My Room by the Beach Boys. Describing her work with white teen idol James Darren, Love explained, quote, there were no whoops, no hollers, no melisma, no shouts, all we had to do was echo the lead with prim was and proper woe woes. And yet, because we were black, I guess we gave his records a depth of sound, even though it wasn't gospel or raw R&B. This sound is what made a name for us on the LA studio scene. The Blossoms could also sound black. That is, they could bring in the gospel inflections when recording with the likes of Sam Cooke or the Ronettes or with Betty Everett uh, on the song, on the Shoop Shoop song, It's In His Kiss. By the end of the decade, those gospel inflections and the black church sound of soul were in demand, finding their way into the sound of rock. Audible blackness was in fashion. The British singer Dusty Springfield was an early white adapter of the black sound, both through her own vocal style and through her collaborations with Madeline Bell, a black American singer who first came to London as part of the gospel play Black Nativity. This is um, Bell and also two um, British singers, uh, Leslie Duncan, I'm sorry, Bell uh, and Doris Troy, who are African American, and a white British singer, Leslie Duncan, backing up Dusty Springfield. I suspect that Springfield's work inspired the male British rockers who soon followed suit. All of these artists had already been imbibing black music, framing their work as rhythm and blues, and covering songs first performed by African American artists. Eventually, some of them began to include actual African American artists on their recordings. So I should point out that many of these collaborations were transatlantic exchanges between black American women and white British artists. Some of these women took up residence in England, Doris Troy and Madeline Bell, who I just mentioned, and P.P. P. Arnold, who I'm about to discuss, developed rel relatively high profiles as solo artists in Great Britain. A notable early example of white rock men and black soul women working together is on the Small Faces song, Tin Soldier, from 1967, featuring lead singer Steve Marriott and background vocalist P.P. P. Arnold. Arnold had put down roots in London after arriving there as an Iket with the Iken, when the Ike and Tina Turner Review toured Great Britain with the Rolling Stones in 1966. The Small Faces were one of the bands on the British rhythm and blues scene that spawned the Stones, the Yardbirds, and the Who, but unlike their colleagues, they never really gained a foothold in the U.S. By the time of this recording, P.P. P. Arnold was signed to the same label as the Small Faces, Immediate Records. 
1967, she recorded the original version of The First Cut is the Deepest, a song that Rod Stewart had a hit with 10 years later. Arnold released her first solo recording, The First Lady of Immediate, in 1967, and she played gigs with the Small Faces as her backing band. Some of the tracks on her album were produced by Rolling Stones vocalist Mick Jagger. Maybe he had the sound of the voices of Arnold and Marriott intertwining in mind when working on the Let It Bleed, Bleed album a couple of years later. The Rolling Stones uh, formed as a band in 1962. We all heard about this last year with their 50th anniversary. Um, and their goal was presenting, quote, authentic Chicago rhythm and blues using outstanding exponents like Muddy Waters, Jimmy Reed, and Howlin' Wolf, end quote. And that quote is from a letter that founding member Brian Jones wrote to the BBC in the band's early days trying to explain what, they were, uh, what the band was up to. By the end of the 1960s, the Rolling Stones had expanded their musical palette to incorporate the sound of soul. Their most remarkable foray into the form was on Gimme Shelter, recorded in 1969 and released on the album Let It Bleed. Mary Clayton, a Los Angeles-based artist, was called in for the session at the last minute, replacing a flu-ridden Bonnie Bramlett, the white American vocalist who has the distinction of having been the only white Iket. White Doing the session with the Stones was new territory for Clayton. In an interview, Clayton told me, quote, I, never sung, I had never sung rock and roll until I worked with the Rolling Stones, end quote. Speaking to a Rolling Stone magazine reporter in 1970, she recalled, quote, it was quite easy. Mick and Keith just stood in front of me and told me where they wanted me to sing, any way that I felt it, end quote. It was an auspicious start. So if you pay attention to the sound of the recording as opposed to the liner notes, you could reasonably call Gimme Shelter a duet. Here, the background singer is unusually prominent. I think it's worth commending Mick Jagger and Keith Richards for leaving Clayton so up front in the mix. Working without a written part and singing what she felt, Clayton brought the intensity of gospel singing and broke the cardinal rule of the background singer. She drew attention to herself and nearly overshadowed the lead vocalist and she helped create a rock and roll classic in the process. Jagger and Richards continued to use black women backing vocalists on other recordings. Here are Clyde King and Vanetta Fields sharing a sequence of call and response with Mick Jagger on the 1972 single, Tumbling Dice. The Rolling Stones' output of the early 70s, albums like Sticky Fingers and Exile on Main Street, are hard rock classics. But listen to the horn sections and the rollicking energy, and in the case of Exile, the voices of Clyde King and Vanetta Fields, and you can recognize the impact and influence of soul music on the rock and roll the band was creating. They weren't alone. After working with the Rolling Stones, Mary Clayton collaborated with Joe Cocker, an England-born singer whose gravelly vocals indicate his debt to soul music. Given Cocker's well-documented adulation of Ray Charles, whose vocal timbre and inflections he emulated, it's not surprising that he would be eager to record with Clayton, who had sung background for Ray Charles. They collaborated on Cocker, Cocker's first five albums, with Clayton contributing vocals, doing the vocal arrangements for the background singers, and hiring the girls for the sessions. And they're always girls in these re recording contexts, never women. One of the things Mary Clayton liked about session singing was that this lucrative work allowed her to stay home with her family in Los Angeles and avoid the travails of life on the road. When Joe Cocker took his show on tour, Clayton stayed in LA, but she helped him hire some of the singers who made up the motley crew of about a dozen background singers, including Claudia Lanier, uh, that, and they all accompanied him on the Mad Dogs and Englishmen tour, and there's a pretty well-known documentary of that tour. Now those singers were not exclusively African American, but they sang in a gospel-shaped style. The visibility of the Jagger-Clayton duet yielded opportunities for Clayton and brought awareness of her name to a larger audience. She was the original acid queen in the Who's Tommy, singing the role when the rock opera was staged with a 104-piece London Symphony Orchestra and 60-voice chamber choir in 1972. Tina Turner played the role in the film version. <laughs> 
During the 1970s, Clayton recorded a handful of solo albums, but she always did session work. A partial listing of her credits gives a snapshot of how widespread the use of black women's soulful voices was in the early 1970s. Uh, she contributed background vocals on recordings by Buffalo Springfield, Carol King, Leon Russell, Jerry Garcia, Leonard Skinner, Neil Young, Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Rare Earth, Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett, and Linda Ronstadt. The other background vocalists had similar trajectories, participation in numerous recordings, and in some cases, opportunities to do their own solo work. Although significantly, none of the recordings Clayton, Claudia Lanier, or Clyde King, all of whom remain based in the United States, um, really took off. This is in part because once operating as solo artists, their labels and producers had trouble figuring out which material was appropriate for these black women with one foot in rock and one foot in soul. Which style should they sing? What audience would embrace them? One side of Claudia Lanier, Claudia Lanier's 1974 solo album, Few, and that's P-H-E-W, Few, is rollicking guitar-centered rock. The other side highlights soul-style horn, soul -style horn arrangements uh, written and produced by Alan Toussaint. Interestingly, some white women vocalists became proficient at delivering a black sound or something close enough to it. One example is the group of women who provided background vocals on Pink Floyd's 1973 album, Dark Side of the Moon. Liza Strike, Barry St. John, and Leslie Duncan were all white English women, and I'm sorry I don't have photos of them to show you. Uh, and they were joined by the gospel and soul singer D D uh, Doris Troy, who's best known for her 1963 single, Just One Look. On Eclipse, the last track of Dark Side of the Moon, Liza Strike and Doris Troy sing with Roger Waters. When Pink Floyd went on tour in the mid-1970s, they hired Vanetta Fields and Carlina Williams, known as the Blackberries, to sing these and other background parts live. And as an aside, Vanetta Fields and Clyde King worked with Barbara Streisand. There's no real reason for me to have this in the talk. I just like this picture of Barbara Streisand. And <laughs> so I thought I'd put it in. Uh, but it is an example of someone from the pop side of things tapping into the soul sound. Uh, this photo is from 1976 or so when they worked with her on the film soundtrack for A Star Is Born, but the relationship had started in 1971 with the album Barbara Drove Streisand. Fields and King also worked with the American band <clears throat> Steely Dan and with the British band Humble Pie. Reflecting on her work with these artists in 2004, Vanetta Fields told journalist Candia Crazy Horse, quote, that was the time when every act had to have three black American singers in the band. They wanted to feel and hear the blackness. They would do anything and pay anything to get it or experience it, end quote. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, many in the rock scene swooned over the vocal power of Aretha Franklin. This adulation facilitated her 1971 appearance at the Fillmore West, one of the San Francisco venues that helped launch the 1960s counterculture. In fact, it may be a fascination with her voice in particular that encouraged so many white British artists to incorporate the sound of black women's gospel-inflected voices into their music. In 1975, David Bowie, reportedly obsessed with Franklin, according to his then-girlfriend and background singer, Ava Cherry, set about creating what he ultimately dubbed Plastic Soul. He recorded Young Americans, an album that featured vocal arrangements provided by Luther Vandross, who was just starting out on his professional music path, and used a quartet of background vocalists to lend some authenticity to his plasticity. I've been focused on the role of black women collaborating to help create an authentic black sound, but in this example, men are involved. Luther Vandross was a musical director and the backing vocalist he worked with included uh, Anthony Hinton. There are other examples of men singing and playing on the recordings of white rockers. Billy Preston is probably the first to come to mind. Here he is with George Harrison in an especially ecstatic moment. Um, he also played organ on several Rolling Stones tracks from the Sticky Fingers and Black and Blue albums. But on most occasions, it was black women who were playing the role, this role. After a long run on the top of the British music charts with his band T-Rex, Mark Bolan, a leading figure in glam rock, added Gloria Jones to his group. She arrived with an impressive resume. 
She had played piano at the church where her father was minister, and when she was 14, she began singing with Kojic, a gospel group that featured Billy Preston, and Kojic is the acronym for Church of God in Christ, a sanctified denomination. She recorded the singles Tainted Love in 1964 and Heartbeat in 1965, and these records made her a leading figure in the northern soul scene, a British music subculture built on a passion for 60s era American soul. In the late 1960s and early 70s, she worked as a writer and producer at Motown, creating music, I mean, writing material for Junior Walker, Eddie Kendricks, David Ruffin, the Jackson Five, and Jermaine Jackson. She began working with Bolin at a point when his creative energy and chart success were flagging after a string of UK top 10 hits that included Bang A Gone, Get It On, Jeepster, and Telegram Sam. A Melody Maker profile on Jones offered a tart, um, yeah, a 1973 Melody Maker profile on Gloria Jones offered a tart depiction of the situation. Quote, when white rock gets stale or finds its expressive limitations have been exhausted, there are two ways out. One, add horns. Two, add girl backup singers, preferably black. Soul and inspiration follows, end quote. Jones contributed backing vocals and clavinet playing to the T-Rex album she worked on. Here's a bit of the song, Token of My Love, from Zip Gun Boogie. And my final example, uh, because if, if you're doing a talk about rock and roll, you have to mention Bob Dylan, I think. So in 1978, Bob Dylan began a foray into gospel and soul that culminated in a conversion to Christianity. And over the next few years, he wrote music that explored and expressed his newfound spiritual condition and called in black women to assist in the process of tapping into black sound that had always been a hallmark of his career. On the album Street Legal, Slow Train Coming, and Saved, and on the related tours, Dylan sang with African-American background singers Carolyn Dennis, Joanna Harris, Regina Havis, Clyde King, Helena Springs, and Mona Lisa Young. And not all at the same time, but these are the women that um, worked with him doing background vocals in that period. This is a sample uh, of a satisfied mind. I could go on with these examples, but my point is to indicate how present black women's voices were in a range of music produced during what we now call the classic rock era. In fact, soulful black female backing vocals became so ubiquitous in late 60s and early 70s rock that Lou Reed anchored the chorus of his 1972 single, Walk on the Wild Side, with the lyric, and the colored girls go do, 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 do. And that, incidentally, is a background vocal sung by the white British backup trio, Thunder Thighs, uh, who were Karen Friedman, Darry Larlou, Lalou, and Casey Singe. Through the collaborations that Reed's lyrics reference, African-American women carved a space for themselves in rock as they brought the vocal power, distinctive timbre, and emotional intensity that they had cultivated as singers of African-American sacred music to the genre. This gospel-rooted sound became an inextricable part of rock, and its energy and emotion indexed authenticity for many listeners, black and white. Understanding the meanings associated with black women's vocal presence in rock of this era demands engagement with the ways ideas about race, gender, sexuality, and music making intersect to construct ideas of musical authenticity. At one level, the sound of black women's voices in a rock context dominated by male vocalists offered a jolt of sonic energy and musical substance as their strong and accurate singing enriched the sound of the recordings they contributed to, expanding the sonic spectrum. In addition to the novelty, romanticized notions of black identity and black sound fueled the attraction to black women's voices. Stereotypes led artists and audience members to believe that black Americans had a special capacity for authentic musical expression and privileged access to emotion, spirituality, and sexuality. This viewpoint grew out of an old and resilient set of practices that constructed understandings of blackness and whiteness in opposition to one another, figuring black people as closer to nature than white people who were modern and civilized. Minstrelsy, in which white performers put on blackness literally with burnt cork and performatively with what were perceived to be black gestures and voices, is the best known musical consequence of this dynamic of fascination and repulsion that grew out of these conditions. <laughs> 
By the 1960s, rock and roll had become the latest iteration of what was by then a long-standing practice of white borrowing of black musical style. What is interesting about the collaboration between white predominantly male rock artists and black predominantly female background vocalists is the inclusion of actual black people in the process of white borrowing and reproduction of black sound at a time when the idea that rock music was, that rock was music by and for white youth um, when that idea was solidifying. I asked Mary Clayton, who sang background on the Stones' Gimme Shelter, to assess the qualities of her voice that made so many people want to have her on the recordings. She identified, quote, the warm soulfulness and spirituality of my voice, end quote. And then she went on to, um, she, and she underscored that it all came from her gospel background, and she went on to say, quote, that's gospel music, that's called the good news music, so I guess I have good news in my voice, end quote. The gospel-rooted good news sound that Clayton and other black women vocalists provided was a different and desired sound. It indexed authenticity and un unadulterated emotion, real feeling unhindered by white middle-class notions of propriety. Many white artists of the rock era wanted to produce this sound when they sang, and they did their best to perform the throaty rasps and other vocal mannerisms that characterize soul and gospel singing, the features I mentioned earlier in this paper. Translating the voices in, they heard and idealized in their heads to the voices that issued from their bodies, they put on their versions of blackness in order to sound good and, ironically, to sound authentic. Sounding black also meant sounding cool, a category that had become increasingly important in youth culture and one that was accessed through proximity to blackness. As musicologist Annie Randall has noted, quote, little has been written about British rock's complex vocal element with strongly avowed roots in the gospel tradition and the role black women played in its creation, end quote. Rock music historians have spent far more time discussing the ways white male musicians borrowed from black male musicians, especially blues artists such as Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters. But the fact of the matter is, in the early years of rock and roll, African-American women such as Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, Memphis Minnie, Big Mama Thornton, Ruth Brown, Laverne Baker, Etta James, Tina Turner, Nina Simone, Odetta, and the Shirelles were vocal models for white and black artists, both male and female. With the incorporation of black women background vocalists, African-American women became an actual presence on the recordings of a cross-section of white artists. Significantly, it was black women and not black men who were central actors in the face-to-face -face musical exchanges that white rock artists committed to, to record. These musical encounters between black women and white men reflected sonic and social preferences that were shaped by ideas about race, gender, sexuality, and musicality. In terms of aesthetics, placing white male and black female voices side by side provided a heightened vocal contrast between a male and female voice and a white and black vocal style. At an interpersonal level, male ego and masculine anxiety, perhaps accompanied by the perception that it would be easier to manage women, might have led to the exclusion of, actual, of the actual black men whose sound and affect so many of these white male artists were appropriating. There might have been logistical and economic considerations. It was probably easier and less expensive to hire female session singers than to schedule studio time with prominent male musicians whose touring commitments, recording contracts, and monetary demands may have impeded their ability to collaborate on record. But the young white male artists may have also felt less threatened or intimidated by black women than black male musicians, especially the older musicians who were the objects of their adulation. Many of these white rockers were, in some way or another, engaged in forms of mu musical, musical appropriation that bled into racial mim mimicry. To some extent, they were performing a version of black masculinity. Having an actual black man around might have been daunting. Meanwhile, the physical and vocal presence of a black woman let credibility, lent credibility to the performance, blackening the proceedings. Whatever the reason, the, des the decision to employ black women as backup singers was so widespread that a number of black women whose quest for solo singing careers had been less than successful or had not yet taken off were able to sustain themselves economically and develop respected professional profiles by working as backup singers. Some of the collaborations between white men and black women led to friendships and creative partnerships, as well as sexual and romantic relationships. As I've researched the interracial musical interactions, I've been learning about the personal dynamics and attractions between these artists. Black women were not simply an enticing vocal other, but also an attractive racial sexual other, especially in England, 
where black women's bodies, like their voices, seem to hold special powers. I hasten to point out that this fascination with an, with an other ran in both directions. The black women I'm discussing, for the most part born in the 1940s, probably had been taught that it was best to avoid dealings with white men who would be content to have sex with them but, not, but would not marry them. This warning, coupled with the specter of the white male rape of black women during the era of slavery and beyond, ought to have been a deterrent. But in the 1960s, racial rules were breaking down, and the rock and roll scene was a realm of collaboration between blacks and whites. Racism and sexism were certainly present, but some of the black women I've been researching, perhaps inspired by the ethos of freedom in the air and their own maverick spirits, explored relationships that crossed the boundaries, the boundaries of race. Excavating these relationships puts a different spin on rock and roll history, I think. Um, I'll show you some photos that I was able to pull off the web, and I, I don't have a photo for every pair, but there are enough to create a photo essay that adds another layer to the rock and roll narrative. Um, we can start with the picture here. There was Bob Dylan and Clyde King, and also Bob Dylan and Carolyn Dennis, another African-American black, uh, another African-American background singer to whom he was secretly married and with whom he had a child. There's Gloria Jones and Mark Bolin, pictured here with their son, Roland, Roland Bolin. Um, there's David Bowie and Ava Cherry. There's Steve Marriott and P.P. P. Arnold. There's Keith Richards and Ronnie Bennett of the early 60s girl group, The Ronettes. They met when The Ronettes toured England with The Stones as the opening act. Uh, the Ronettes also hung out with The Beatles during the lad's first visit to New York. Um, and in her autobiography, Ronnie Bennett recalls pairing off with John Lennon while her cousin Nedra Talley spent time with George Harrison. Um, and this is one of the photos where I, I, I've seen George Harrison looking like this is, he's happier here than I see him in most photos. Um, <laughs> so he liked, he liked Nedra. Uh, uh, in the end, Ronnie Bennett married her producer who she's sitting next to in this photo, Phil Spector. He had built his wall of sound and his reputation as a genius producer with the help of her voice and that of Darlene Love of the Blossoms, who, I was, who was the first musical example that I shared. There's Mick Jagger with Claudia Lanier, here pictured with Ike and Tina Turner. Some say Lanier was the inspiration for the Rolling Stones song, Brown Sugar. Others suggest it was Marsha Hunt. Uh, the African-American singer and actress who took London by storm in the 60s with her striking looks and her role in the London version of Hair. Her only child, Karis, is Mick Jagger's firstborn child. And then stepping away from heterosexual examples, we can think of uh, LaBelle's Nona Hendricks and Vicki Wickham, the white Englishwoman who, as manager of LaBelle, helped the group reconceptualize their sound and image for the 1970s. When I started my research, I didn't anticipate delving into the love and sex lives of these artists. But the realities and fantasies of race and gender and sexuality animate the genre. Talking about these interpersonal connections in tandem with the discussion of black women's vocal influence on rock and roll through their presence as background vocalists and through their roles, their role as models of vocal style enriches and complicates the way we think about the form and those who participate in it. In researching black women background singers, I'm using an approach that attends to the interdependence of music making, race, sexuality, and power. And this perspective encourages us to think about the processes of historical erasure and inscription of recording industry decision making and of genre labeling that centered white men and that used but marginalized black women who were, in fact, co-artists with and sonic models for white male rockers. Discussing the background role black women played in the late 1960s and 1970s might also suggest reasons that it was so challenging for black women to step into the spotlight as rock artists during this period, which is another of my preoccupations. Um, Singer-songwriter Betty Davis, who's on the far side of the slide, and then LaBelle, who's closer to me, uh, developed rock-inspired music and performances in the early 1970s, but they struggled to find audiences for their work. These artists, their producers and managers, could not reconcile competing assumptions about race, gender, and genre. For the most part, they were unable to find effective ways to promote black women artists who were creating racially mixed sounds in an increasingly segregated context. This was not a problem for white artists with similarly, similarly hybrid music sounds. In fact, that hybrid of, white, hybrid of white sounds and black sounds was the heart of late 60s and early 70s hard rock. 
The restrictions black women face draw attention to the ways race and gender can shape access to musical opportunities. It was fine for black women to sing, black American women to sing background. Indeed, they were perceived as necessary to the proceedings and served as sources of authentic sound and, sonic help, and, and as sonic helpmates. But as African Americans and as women, they did not fit the increasingly widespread notion that a rock artist was a young white man. Focusing attention on the presence of African American women in rock challenges conventional wisdom. It expands the way we think about the sound of rock and the way we think about African American women as cultural producers. As black feminist critic Patricia Hill Collins has observed, this type of move can challenge a power structure that has named and defined black women into and outside of certain categories, practices, and identities. My purpose in documenting and analyzing the role of black women vocal, background vocalists is to start the process of writing new narratives that recognize the contributions of these artists and reveal why it's so hard to hear the voices of African American women in music they were so much a part of creating. Thank you. Fantastic, Maureen. Well, we've got time for some, some questions here, so uh, anybody would like to kick off? Here, we've got a question right here. You were talking about how there were three background vocalists. Mm -hmm. um, is there any connection to like the three-part gospel harmony, or was it just to have a critical mass of that sound? I think it's they were trying to get the harmony. I think in most of these cases, one, there was sort of like a woman who was the one who was put in charge and it was sort of her job to hire, to hire the singers for the, the session and to figure out what the session needed. And so they probably just reached back to the tradition that they were trained in. And they didn't always have three, but that was sort of, I think that might have been the goal. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely connected to gospel practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I've, I haven't been able to talk to a lot of these women, so I don't know, and it's not something that they, from the interviews that I've read, they, a lot of them were interviewed at this time, they were sort of visible enough to be um, interviewed in Rolling Stone or in Melody Maker, uh, which is a, a British uh, music paper. So they didn't seem to get asked that question so much. Um, I, I talked with Gloria Jones, who was the one, uh, the woman who sang with Mark Bolin, and she described herself as um, being sort of caught up, uh, maybe in a pre-Black Power I, um, ideal of we didn't of we didn't see color. So that was the way she framed it, and she didn't. Talk, she had been in a very black in the very black context of Motown. Uh, and then shifted over, and 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 the shifts are—it's it, back and forth. It's not that they go from one and then you know to the another to the other, and then just stay there. There's a lot of movement back and forth, so there's a lot of crossing. And they were also doing background. I mean, something I could think of adding is the background singing that they were doing for black artists, because they weren't only working for white artists. It's just, with that white artists, it's just that there was suddenly this moment when white artists wanted to have them on the recordings. But that question of how they perceived what they were doing or whether they had criticism isn't one that I've gotten a lot of information on, but it's an, it is an important, uh, especially in that time period, it's an important issue. So thanks for raising it. Jake? Yeah, you know, the, the difficult thing is I don't have a lot, this is what sort of the limits of the archive, so the, they are not always asked, why did you use these singers and what were you trying to go for? Some of it is assumed, and a lot of it just isn't discussed, they're just sort of there. Um, so in England, there were white women who 
had been able to, like Liza Strike and Leslie Duncan, who were able to capture this sound, and they were used uh, alongside the black women. I don't know if there was a perception among artists and probably different individuals or different producers or different musicians had different ideas whether it was gonna be more authentic or better if you had the, the black woman vocalist. Some of it, a lot of it was just availability because of the way studio time operated. You just, you had the, you know, the reason Mary Clayton got on that Rolling Stones song was because the studio time was booked for th this hour and they needed the singer there so they could get the recording done. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of discussion, specific discussion of producers or the artists saying that they really wanted a black woman's voice. It's something that, it's a sound that's clear that they wanted from the way that they were putting together their recordings. Oh, okay. This is, this is from Chris. Okay. From the internet. <laughs> um, it was a long, pretty long question, but I'm just going to kind of summarize it here. Um, okay. The, uh, the last part of the question is, um, he wonders if you discuss um, contemporary punk rock and backup singers sort of in that context, and what the different what you say, and can you apply the same theories of gender and race and the different dynamics that you discussed with the 70s or late 70s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't focused, I'm really focused on, on the history, so I haven't talked about what's, what's happening now. I think what's interesting is it's still a practice that you can just see if, you, if you're watching musical performances. You know, people use background singers because they, they fill out the sound, and especially in rock when um, we love, there are a lot of rock artists who we love who really are not good, good singers in the traditional or conventional sense of the word. So the, the thing that background vocalists do is they fill out and they sort of are sort of like a correction or um, they're able to augment the sound. And so you still see that happening in recordings. And it's very often, it's again, not exclusively, but it's very often black women singers. Um, so I think it's still being done whether because we're in a very, you know, sort of a different moment. I, I don't believe we're post-racial, but we're in a different moment. So whether the musicians would articulate um, the desire for authenticity and talk about blackness in the way that it was talked about in the 60s and 70s, I don't think, I don't necessarily think would be the case. It might be. Um, but there's still a desire for, um, for that sound. And I have your question for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that is, I think that's the case. And you know, you would have to be someone who really read liner notes to even be paying attention to it. And it's not clear that most consumers really were thinking about the way these recordings were, were constructed. And the, the singers are not always named on the liner notes. And so people just sort of, I think people just came to take for granted that this was the sound and that, oh, the Rolling Stones have women in the band? I mean, I don't, I don't think that that was necessarily in people's minds as they were listening. They were just listening and they thought it sounded good or they didn't like this cut, you know, whichever, uh, whatever their response was. But um, I feel like for a lot of listeners, it, it was not um, something that they paid attention to. But I should say that one of the ways that I got into this um, and sort of started to be, started to pay attention to these singers myself was through the work that I did with the Black Rock Coalition and talking with those musicians. These are African American musicians who would have been coming of age during this period and like coming of musical age and they were listening to this music. They were, as African Americans who were in, interested in rock and being, in a lot of cases, vilified for their interest in rock, uh, were very aware that there were black artists on these recordings. So they were the ones who, you know, told, they were the first people to talk to me about Mary Clayton. I had never, I never knew who that voice was on that recording. I never really thought about it. They were the ones who pointed out, you know, who she was and what her background was. So there were some listeners who were paying attention to it. <laughs> 
Um, I think you might have heard Lena Dawes, and she's recently published a book called What Are You Doing Here? Uh, and I can't remember the subtitle, but the, the title is so good you can find the rest of it. But it's, it's basically a, a, a black woman uh, whose her genre is heavy metal. So that it's, it's, it's more specific than rock. She's actually Canadian. She, she, was, she grew up in Canada. Um, so I think there's still a perception that rock music is not music for black people. But ironically or sadly, as rock has sort of diminished in influence and it's not like the central music that it was in the 70s and 80s or even the 90s, um, it's been a little bit easier for, for black Americans or, or black people to, to kind of get access to it and, and enter into it as performers. Uh, but it's still, I think it's still limited. Um, there, along with the Black Rock Coalition, which was founded in 1985, there's more, a more recent group that's not really an organization, but there's Afropunk. Um, and there's a great documentary by James Spooner called Afropunk, and it talks about um, the experience of growing up black and be in the United States and being into punk music. So there are examples, in, you know, and so for heavy metal, um, punk, and uh, sort of more straight ahead rock of spaces that uh, African Americans have tried to sort of create for themselves to, to, to participate in the music, but I think there's still a lot of questioning and there's a, there are a lot of assumptions about, in terms of African American identity in, in general, that there are just certain things that black people do and then there are other things that we're not supposed to do. And you, if you're in those spaces, you're, you are questioned. I think that still takes place. Mm-hmm. For example, in Britain, you're more recognized. Yeah. I noticed, um, yeah. Well, you noticed on the album cover, PPR with the small faces, mm -hmm. she was on there. Right. Yeah. That, and that actually, that's not an album cover. That's a, that was a photo that ran in, the, in a paper advertising a show. But there was a difference. Um, I think there was a difference in the reception and the way they were regarded in, in England. They were, um, every, Marsha Hunt, who was one of the women I had up um, on the screen, who, uh, she stayed in England. She still lives in, I think she lives in Ireland now, but she stayed in Great Britain. And she wrote, she published a memoir and she describes England in the 19, she arrived I think in 1966 and she said at that point, she used the language that the, that the Brits were using at the time. She said spades were in fashion. So there was a sort of a real interest in black culture, especially the music, because it's really coming from the, the blues scene that starts in the late, you know, late 50s, early 1960s. Um, there's this real passion for black American music. And there were not a lot of black American people there. But when the people actually show up, they are pretty well received, the, in, at least among the musicians. Um, and so they kind of want, want to be around them. They want to kind of have access to them. And so that is what gave these black women a, a space to perform. Um, and they were, I think they were able to do sort of solo projects more quickly than the women who stayed in the United States were. And I think they did better in terms of the visibility of their careers. Uh, as solo artists, and they were you know, also respected at, you know, for their, their singing, uh, their background singing. Uh, in the U.S., it's a, it's a more uh, maybe ambivalent relationship uh, because the, 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 the white Brits don't have a history with black Americans. The white Americans have a, a history with black Americans, or there's a history that they're aware of, um, and it's a very fraught history, as we all know. So there's, there's some tensions, even as there's so much wanting to access black music, it's the same in the United States. Rock and roll is, uh, is you know, develops and changes as white, more and more white Americans get involved in producing it and creating it and sort of taking it in new directions, but it's starting out as a, as a black form in a lot of ways. Uh, but there's, there's a little bit of a nervousness or maybe a discomfort um, that's just part of the history of race in the United States. And so 
the, the connections um, perhaps are a little more tenuous. Um, and I haven't quite figured out, I, th I, I do think that the white English singers use these singers more than the white American singers do. Um, I haven't counted, but it's just sort of looking down the list of who the main um, artists were doing this. It seems more of a British thing, but it's, it's still present in the US, but not, not to the same degree, I think. Yeah, I you know compensation. I'm not sure because um, I have no idea what like what the differences were bef between what scale was in in the U.S. at that time and what scale was in in England, and that's probably what they were getting. Just there's a set fee if you're a musician, a session musician or a session singer, this is what you get. Or maybe in a special situation you can negotiate something more. I don't know if one was better than the other or if they were pretty much com comparable. But I do think in terms of, like someone like Madeline Bell, um, I wouldn't say she's a household name, but if you are a rock, if you're a British person, a rock, someone who was growing up during this time listening to the music, you would probably recognize her name in a way that I wouldn't say a white American growing up listening to this music would recognize the name of Mary Clayton. So there's, I think there's just a different, they were able to achieve a different level of, of prominence there. Hmm? Any further questions? Well, I'd like to thank Lori very much for a fantastic presentation. Before we, before we uh, adjourn, though, uh, let me just say a couple things. MUR 130 students, again, the sign-up sheet is next to cookies. The cookies have been taunting these students now for over an <laughs> So uh, let me just say that, uh, that uh, please, I don't want to take any of these home. So please help yourself up with the reception here. Let's thank Lori again for a fantastic presentation.